Thanks for the introduction. Thanks to Barb and to Ginger for, for bringing us both out here. And I just want to say, you know, you guys have a great uh, uh, building, workspace, whatever you want to call it. I'm just bummed I didn't get invited for the full day. <laughs> so I could make use of the massage facilities and uh, your video games and everything else. I just want the tea thing. And the, no, the tea bot. Uh, the tea bot, yes. Yeah. Yes. I would like I to have that. I didn't think you said that. Uh, well, it's great to, to be talking to you again, Vit, um, uh, and thank everyone for coming. Um, let's see, I, I thought we would uh, begin our conversation with crazy rich Asians. <laughs> you mentioned it during our tour, and I thought that'd be a good place to start. Mm -hmm. um, I think by the movie and the, the book's definition, uh, I don't believe either of us are crazy rich, but you're doing quite well. Yes. I, I think we're only so, one out of three. We're Asians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, the movie uh, is a starting point for uh, an op-ed you wrote recently mm -hmm. in the New York Times um, about narrative plenitude, uh, about how a movie as, as popular as Crazy Rich Asians can never be on its own. It can never on its own vitalize the presence of Asian Americans on the screen, um, and, and that we need as, as many uh, uh, of those kinds of movies uh, to do that. And this idea you, you kind of came up with in, in your book, Nothing Ever Dies, um, and speaks to a scenario where stories featuring certain races or communities are in abundance, and in that abundance allows for not only uh, a range of portrayals, but also a range of quality of portrayals, right? Uh, it, it bestows upon them the privilege of, of being mediocre, um, because there are uh, enough high quality portrayals to absorb the, the low quality ones. Uh, whereas you say narrative scarcity uh, does not allow for, for something like that, for mediocrity, for example, uh, and that it's narrow or inhuman or simply mediocre portrayals ends up defining that race or community. So uh, uh, I wanted to ask you if you could talk more about this idea of narrative plenitude uh, and how it affects the Asian American community and, and your own personal confrontation with it. Well, you grew up in, in Oklahoma, I did. right? So I think you probably had, had, had an even harder time of it mm. than I did, which is I grew, and I grew up in San Jose in Northern California in the 70s and 80s. And San Jose in Northern California, it's a diverse multicultural place and everything like that, right? And I, I grew up uh, in a rougher part of town, and so I was surrounded by Vietnamese refugees and Mexican immigrants and, mm. and people like that. Uh, but even so, you know, at a certain point, uh, I, I, I had a very personal confrontation with this idea that there weren't enough stories about people like us. And that is, I, I went to a very elite high school. Uh, it was mostly an all-white high school, except that there was a handful of us who were of Asian descent. Mm. Okay? But we, we knew we were different, we just didn't know how. But every day at lunch, we would gather in a corner of the campus, and we would call ourselves the Asian Invasion. <laughs> And this was 19, in the mid-1980s, right? So we, that, that was the only language we had for ourselves was, was this racist term. Uh, and obviously, instead of being crazy rich Asians at the time, we knew we were the Asians who were threatening to, to take over. Um, and the funny thing was, last year I had a chance to go back to visit that campus mm -hmm. and give a talk to all 1,600 students, and we really have taken over. You know? <laughs> but that's another story. Looking back at that time, I think what I realize now that I, that I didn't know then is that we were living in narrative scarcity, mm. that we didn't have enough stories about us, and that the only stories that we could refer to were these racist mm. stories about Asians who were invading. Obviously, these, you know, the idea of Asian wars and things like that, mm. which many of us had come from or had fled from. Mm. And what I, looking back, I know that you know, what I needed, what we all needed back then were more stories, right? And we needed more writers, we needed more filmmakers, we needed more artists, we needed more politicians, we needed more journalists who would be getting our stories and our voices out there. And that is the difference between narrative scarcity and narrative plenitude. Narrative scarcity means very few of the stories out there are about you, wherever you happen to be whatever my, kind of minority you happen to be coming from. Mm -hmm. Narrative plenitude is when almost all the stories are about you. And that's one of the surest signs that you're a part of some kind of majority, 
when you can take it for granted that some fundamental part of who you are is being shown to you in the stories that you encounter. And when you live in an environment like that, you totally take it for granted, mm -hmm. right? So when somebody makes a stupid Hollywood movie, you can say, that's just, that's just, a, that's just Hollywood. That's just, a, that's just a movie. It's just a story. What's my students say that all the time? I, I say, you're right. One story that's a bad story is just a story. You know? But when all the stories are, are saying the same thing, yeah. then it's more than just a story. It's actually saying something fundamental about the culture. And so again, when all the stories are about you, it's saying something about who you are as a part of this culture. And when most of the stories are not about you or not about us, then when the one story comes out that is about you, enormous weight yeah. is put on that. So for better or for you worse. You can't casually dismiss it. You can't, you can't yeah. casually dismiss it. So when, when, you know, when Crazy Rich Asians came out, there's mm -hmm. the reason why there was so much pressure put on this is because Hollywood had not made a movie with Asian American leading actors in about 25 years since mm -hmm. Joy Luck Club, right? And so everybody's like, this better be a good movie. Mm. Because if it's a good movie, it'll change all of our fortunes. And if it's a bad movie, we'll never get another movie for another 25 years. That's a totally unfair expectation to put on a movie. But this is what narrative scarcity is about. And I think the, the, the ramifications of that simply beyond the, the, the world of artists and storytellers is that it's true pretty much everywhere else. If you're a part of a minority, you're not allowed the luxury of mediocrity. If you succeed or if you fail, your success or your failure is somehow tied to your entire group. Yeah. Right? I'm assuming, I don't know if it's, I mean, it's true in a lot of corporations. I don't know how true it is here. But you feel this weight, this burden of being representative for your people, whatever that people happens to be. And so I think, you know, we go back just talking about writing. That's, that's, I don't know if that's something that you feel, but certainly um, I think I felt that. Like. And, and was it immediate? I mean, what was the evolution of that? kind of confrontation with this scarcity? Did it, always, did it always come to you in kind of like political terms? Or, or was it just uh, you, know, you noticing, oh, I'm not on the screen, I'm not in books, I'm not on TV? I mean, how did that evolution kind of? Well, when I was growing up, I mean, I get, it gradually dawned on me that you know, I'm Vietnamese. Yeah. I come from a family of Vietnamese refugees. I'm a Vietnamese refugee. And that pretty much the only way my experience or my family's experience or the experience of all these Vietnamese refugees in San Jose meant anything to the rest of the country was through the Vietnam War. Yeah. Right? That, that's the only reason anybody had anything to know. I, I, that's the only reason anybody else had to know about anything about us. Yeah. Uh, but now the problem, though, is that in this country, when people hear the word Vietnam, they don't oftentimes think of the country mm -hmm. right away. Uh, maybe things have changed now. Maybe now when you say Vietnam in 2018, people will think Ban Mi or Pha or something like that. But in 1984, when you say Vietnam, people meant the Vietnam War. Yeah. And when, they say the Viet people, when people say the Vietnam War, the war, they really mean the American War. So it gradually dawned on me that there were no stories about us. Mm. And there were very few stories about Asians in general in the 1980s. So mm. I remember going to a bookstore when I was about 18 or 19 and finding the Joy Luck Club by Amy Tan, which had just gotten published like that year or the year before, and just being amazed that there was a book, a novel, by someone who was Asian or Asian American. That was a mind that it was popular. And that it was popular, yeah. and that it was actually a pretty good book, and mm. so I was blown away by that. Uh, that made a huge difference to me, and made me think, uh, where, have, where has this book been? Mm. Or where have other books been like this? And that set me down the road as a student, as a college student, of trying to find everything that had been written by Asian American writers, mm. first of all, and then secondarily by, by Vietnamese and Vietnamese American writers. And there's a handful of that work out there. You know? um, so sometimes I think about the very first Vietnamese American writer to get published, you know, which was around the 1960s, and how lonely that person <coughs> must have been. Now you and I come out, and there are literally dozens of Vietnamese American writers out yeah. there. But you, couldn't make that assumption two or three decades ago. Well, I, I want to talk about uh, the Vietnam War, especially in terms of its portrayal on the screen. But you know, I, I was first curious, you know, in in what realm or mode of representation, whether it's movies, books, you know, or other art forms, uh, do you think narrative scarcity is uh, most dangerous? And in which mode or realm of representation do you think narrative plenitude can be most beneficial? 
Does that make sense? Well, I go around the country, you know, giving talks, and one of the things I try to tell everybody is, look, you know, people like you and me, we're professional storytellers. We write books for a living, or I write op-eds for the New York Times, but we're all storytellers in the sense that we've all absorbed some, some stories that we take for granted, and we tell these stories to each other all the time. Mm. Most often, for example, about what this country is. What is America? What is it supposed to be? Right? This, th these are stories that we tell each other. And so when the current president says, make America great again, that's a story in four words. And it's an enormously powerful story for a lot of, for a lot of people. Even for people who disagree with the story, it's an enormously powerful story. So we go home and we tell those kinds of stories to other people. Here's a story that I encountered when I was growing up in San Jose. You know, my parents had opened the second Vietnamese grocery store in San Jose, mm. downtown. And I remember walking down the street from my parents' store when I was around 10 or 11 and seeing a sign in the store window, and it said, another American driven out of business by the Vietnamese. That's not just a sign, that's a story in nine words. And it's a story that, in fact, Americans have been telling each other for a very long time. It's just another American driven out of business by fill in the blank. It's been told before. It was told during my parents' time. It's being told again with different populations for fill in the blank. So that's an example of narrative scarcity and narrative plenitude because at that time in the 1980s, we Vietnamese people didn't have the access to try to contest that story. You know, I didn't know how to make sense out of that story or how to try to fight back against it. And meanwhile, their you know, narrative plenitude means that there are people out there with the power to go around telling these kinds of stories yeah. and spreading them around. Asian invasion is a story yeah. like that. And it's a story that, that, that can be disseminated much more widely and, and reinforced you know, more powerfully now with like social media. Yeah. I mean, a five word story like that can, can spread much more powerfully nowadays, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, which underlines their power, right. right? That's a good example because obviously some people, I'm not very good at Twitter, you know? Uh -huh. I, I have like 16,000 followers, uh -huh. which is nothing in the world of Twitter. You know, they're, they're like 15 year old kids out there with probably like 100,000 followers. I don't know what they're doing. They know how to use that medium. They know how to tell stories in 114 genetic characters or less, right? So yeah. there's so many ways to tell stories out there, not just through the world of books or movies and so on. And that's one of the things that social media has done is actually to transform that landscape. And I think that's been empowering for a lot of people as they realize they actually are storytellers that can bypass all the established gatekeepers that you and I have to rely on, like New York publishers and the like. So hopefully that brings to people this, rea this sense that in fact all of us are engaged in narratives in different ways. Well, you talk about, and nothing ever dies, uh, about you know, video games. Uh, that is another narrative that is, uh, I don't think some people realize how, how uh, powerful video games are in terms of how they represent the worlds mm -hmm. in those games. You talk about like first person shooters, for mm -hmm. example. Uh, uh, and uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, it's particularly, I'm, I'm interested in like how in a first person shooter, the, you know, the, the points of view, I mean, when you're trying to kill the enemy, you have to distance yourself from mm -hmm. that enemy and you can't bestow that enemy any humanity because you know, your absolute goal is to, is to destroy uh, your enemy, right? And uh, something like a, a first-person shooter game can really, uh, uh, you know, present a very dangerous narrative. Yeah. Right. Well, well, the video game industry is more p economically profitable than Hollywood, I yeah. think. Because I mean, it's it's, it's it's billions of dollars and all that kind of stuff. And and you know, <laughs> we who are writers, you know, oftentimes when we're only in a room full of writers, we'll make huge grand statements about the power of literature. <laughs> oh, literature will save us. Writing will save us. Blah blah blah. And I'm like, yes, it's true for those people who read books, okay? Or the even smaller population of people who read novels, yeah. right? But everybody, almost everybody, plays video games. And so the reach of video games and the way that they disseminate stories is really powerful, right? You call it seductive, which I think is, I never thought of it in those terms. You're not seduced when you play video games? I don't play video games, oh. you know. Uh, Good for you. I don't know why I don't. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's seductive is a very good word for it. More I, so than any book or, or movie, I feel like it's incredible. I speak as someone easily seduced by video games. So, yeah. you know, throughout stages of my life, I have gone out and bought the latest game console on credit, played it nonstop for a week, and then got sick and disgusted with myself, and then returned it, okay? Because <laughs> I know that if I kept it in the house, I would just never stop playing yeah, these yeah. things. But what I, what I say is, 
that yes, novels and Shakespeare and so on, these are, these are stories that uh, if they're good or if we like them, seduce us through the power of storytelling, right? And get us to empathize with the characters in the plays or the books and the stories and so on. But that's what video games do as well. They get us to empathize with, and we're talking about first person games here, yeah. they get us to empathize with these characters and these narratives that have been created. And people spend more time playing these games than they would reading Marcel Proust. Okay, he wrote, he wrote four volumes of In Search of, of Lost Time, this thick. Your average teenager, never gonna read it. Your average adult, never gonna read these things. But your average game player will spend dozens of hours playing these games in their artificially created worlds. Mm -hmm. And yes, I think they're powerful, and yes, I think they're seductive, and what happens there is that stories can really have implicit yeah. meanings. You know, how many people have ever actually played first-person shooter games? Some, okay, good. I, that, that's the, unfortunately, that's the kind of game I like. I don't know what it says about me. I like to, that's the only game I like playing, shooting and destroying and killing things. Actually, me too. I say I don't play video games, yeah. but when I did, those are the only games I would play. Right, yeah. and on the one hand, yeah, you can probably say they're harmless. On the other hand, are they? I mean, what are they, what are they actually training us to do? What are they, how are they training us to see the world? And the reason it comes up in a book like Nothing Ever Dies, Vietnam and the Memory of War is that I'm you know, trying to make this connection between that and in general, as Americans, our perspective on the world. When we think about the world, how do we, how do we think about the world? You know, Americans are involved all over the world. And we, when we talk strictly about war and the military, we have over 800 bases around the world. This is a reality that you know, most Americans are not engaged with, right? And our military presence is all over the place. But usually, when we think about it, we think about it from the perspective of American soldiers or American pilots or whatever. And when we actually see the world, oftentimes it's through literally the gun scopes of American weaponry or the cameras of drones, right? That to me seems like a direct connection to the first person shooter. Mm -hmm. uh, not to say that everybody who plays a first person shooter is gonna be going out there you know, piloting a drone, but that's part of the connection. Yeah, it's a quite subliminal conditioning, right? Um, so I guess my, my question for you then is like, how would you then advise uh, Asian Americans or any American in their effort to kind of build on something uh, like Crazy Rich Asians? I mean, um, you know, beyond just creating and engaging in these narratives, what else can we do? Well, I, I look back on that time in the 1980s when there were very few stories by and about Asian Americans, and I think, yes, part of the problem was structural racism that were preventing our stories from getting out there, but part of the problem is Asian parents, right? Mm. You know, those of you who are Asian parents oh, are gonna be Asian this. parents and so Asian on. Asian parents, Yeah, please. you know, like, Asian parents have, have bear some responsibility in saying, you know, don't be writers, don't be artists to their kids, uh, don't be creatives, you know, go into tech or medicine or whatever. And all that is very laudable and understandable and everything like that. But, you know, I, I go around, you know, I'm convinced, again, I'm convinced of the power of storytelling, I'm convinced of the power of narrative. You don't have to have breed your kid to be a writer or something like that, but you have to be open to the possibility that stories really matter, okay? and that there's only so many doctors and lawyers and pharmacists and nurses that we need out there. We need other people doing different kinds of things too. Um, so I, I, that is an op-ed I want to write for the New York Times saying, Asian parents, <laughs> do your bit to change the world. And one of the most rewarding things that's happened to me when I go out and I speak a couple of times has been when an Asian parent has come up to me. Like I was at Brown University and this Vietnamese woman came up to me. And she's like 40 something. And she said, oh, I, 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 she either worked in a nail salon or she owned a nail salon. Mm. And she said, my son goes here to Brown. And I said, what does he major in? And he, his major was so weird. It was like the stereotype of a Brown humanities major. I don't even know what it is. You know? But it, was like, it wasn't English, it wasn't women's studies, it was freakier than those things. We combined them. You know? And I said, what do you think of that? And she said, I'm so proud of him. And I was like, that's a story I want to hear. You know. Uh, and so hopefully there are more parents out there like that who, are, who, are, who believe in these possibilities for their kids. I, I agree with you. In a, in a word, I would say I wish Vietnamese parents would embrace weirdness. Mm -hmm. we, we, as a culture, we don't like weirdness. Yeah. You know, 
and uh, in whatever form that is, yeah. you know, to be okay with it, to be somewhat comfortable, or at least comfortable with your discomfort with yeah. weirdness, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, and allow your kids to, 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 to embrace it as well. I think that part of that is due, obviously, to Asian Americans being a relatively small minority in yeah. the last few decades. Uh, and so, of course, when there's fewer people, there's more pressure mm -hmm. because of the scarcity issues, right? And the narrative scarcity, this idea that you know you have to go out there and represent your people mm -hmm. and all of that. So you got to be a good boy or a good girl, or whatever, and go out there and be a doctor and, and do all those kinds of things. But we've the model we're speak Asian. yeah, model Asians. Mm -hmm. But if we're speaking just about Asians, we've crossed the magic threshold. I think we're like five or six percent of the national population. There's more of a critical mass out there. Um, I don't, you know, I, don't, I don't know if the problems with Asian parents are any different than any other parents. I'm assuming if you take a cross-section of America as a whole, a lot of parents out there want their kids to be doctors and lawyers and engineers in order to foot that $60,000 tuition bill and so on. You know, but again, just with a smaller population, there's just more pressure on us. I was also thinking of something you said in Nothing Ever Dies. You referred to Little Saigon in Orange County as uh, the Gray's work of collective memory these defeated people, that it means people have created in the sense that this recreation of home in Southern California, in America, has allowed us, particularly Southern Vietnamese, to control our memories uh, of ourselves from back home uh, and also uh, our own presence here mm -hmm. in America. And uh, it's, it's, I guess it's economic success as, as a mode of cultural capital. Mm -hmm. and, and it made me think that at the center of this is Vietnamese cuisine mm -hmm. and all those Vietnamese restaurants that come out of, you know, that started in Little Saigon and have spread all across the country. The fact that, that Vietnamese cuisine is taken seriously now, mm -hmm. Vietnamese food, everyone not only knows what pho is, or most people do, they also even know how to pronounce it now, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder, it, 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 have you thought, thought of this as a kind of narrative itself, mm -hmm. the, the Vietnamese cuisine? Yeah. Um, so there's a little Saigon in Chicago, right? Or I don't know what you call it, but there's a yeah, neighborhood yeah, of Vietnamese. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So for those of you who have not been to Little Saigon in Orange County, that's that neighborhood 100 times larger. Yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah, you know, basically, one of the ways that you become American in this country is that you own real estate, mm. right? And it's through owning real estate that you, get, you make your presence felt. And so these so-called ethnic neighborhoods are a very important way of Americanization because you go, you drive to Orange County, you drive to Westminster or Santa Ana, you cannot help but see streets and streets and streets full of Vietnamese businesses with Vietnamese signage and all of that. It's a very bold proclamation that we are here, mm. you know, and uh, it is an enormously important part of telling that, that narrative, right? Yeah. And from out of that concentration, this is, this is a very American thing, you know, because I've been to Paris, for example, and, and in, in France, the French don't like this. They don't like ethnic concentrations. But in this country, because of our particular history, we do, or we allow it anyway. And so we tell that kind of a story. And then, of course, besides the real estate, there's the food mm -hmm. that you're talking about. And food is an important story, right? Like, how do we go from a moment in the 1970s and 1980s where the perception, the American perception, racist perception of Vietnamese is that we ate dogs? Mm -hmm. this is a, these were stories that were circulating back then, right? And now we've gone from that to pho. You know, now we've gone from that moment to Rachel Ray mm -hmm. making horrible pho, OK? Uh, <laughs> I was like, that's, you, that, you've just taken something and put the word pho on it, it has no relationship to the actual food. I'm sort of okay with that. You know, I'm sort of okay with that. Because it means that we've actually changed the vocabulary, yeah. we've changed the we've story. We've gotten far enough for someone like that to do something. Right, we've gotten far yeah. enough for someone to debase us in, the, in our food, to appropriate yeah. us, you know. Uh, Trader Joe's as, oh my God. Trader Joe's, I went there, I made a mistake, I just wanted to try it. Gai uh, Kuhn, uh, the spring roll, they have it at, at Trader Joe, Joe's, the vermicelli wrapping around vegetables. It was horrible. It was horrible. You know, but at least we've gotten that far. That's what you mean. It's like that kind of plenitude allows for mediocre or even awful stuff like that. Right. And that's a, it's a kind right. of a good thing. Right. right. Because I think most people will know that if they go and they get pho from Trader Joe's, it's going to suck. Yeah. I, think, I think people are smart enough to know that, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's actually a good thing. You know, for example, when the refugees, my short story collection came out, I went to Costco once, and they had it. They had a pallet full, not a pallet full, they had like several stacks of the refugees, and I thought, I've made it. I've made it. <laughs> made it and so it's the same thing. You, know, you made it to Costco, you made it to Trader Joe's, that's what we're striving, striving for. And this goes into the whole authenticity thing. Like, nobody in their right minds will think they're getting good from Trader Joe's. But the point is, is that then 
people will know. I, people will say, I know where to get the good pho. Yeah, yeah. I'm, in the, I'm in the know. So I know where the authentic Vietnamese food is. And so that's part of the dynamic of narratives as well. Like, oh, you know, these people over here, they don't know enough to do the difference between good ban mi mm -hmm. or, or good pho and bad pho, ban, bad ban mi. We do. Mm -hmm. We don't have to be Vietnamese, but we're really hip. We know what's going on. You know, and so that's true for narratives of all kinds, mm -hmm. whether it's movies or books or food, because now very hip, very hip and smart Americans will go, yeah, I know about fish sauce. I was at Brown. I was just joking around. I, it was a continental restaurant yeah. in, in, in Providence. And I was just looking at my plate of fish, whatever it was, and I thought, it'd be better with fish sauce. And the waiter said, we have fish sauce. <laughs> and he did. You know, he was not Vietnamese. This is not yeah. a Vietnamese restaurant. So I thought, we made it. In this continental European kind of restaurant, they have a bottle of fish sauce for people who ask. But we have a secret ingredient beyond that that most Americans do oh. not know about. Do tell. That's even more authentic than fish sauce. Shrimp paste. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. That Are we going to get there with shrimp paste? That is the nuclear option. Oh, wow. Yeah. But, you know, th th back to the, the, this, this kind of model, Asian, and, and the, especially the kind of economic model of success that, that uh, a lot of immigrants, particularly Vietnamese, uh, really celebrate. You know, and it comes out of, like, the success of a place like Little Saigon. And I wonder about the problematic aspects of that. For example, you know, it, it does reinforce this notion that to be a success, you have to, it has to be an economic success or financial success. Um, and that also, more deeply, I think this is, it seems to me this is how uh, Vietnamese also end up supporting arguments uh, against, you know, immigration and, and you know, uh, against, you know, the, uh, uh, more refu newer refugees coming in. You know, it's this kind of uh, contradiction where people always wonder, like, why would, okay, so my parents voted for, for Trump, right? And, and when you have an example like that, you know, people ask, how could they as refugees now support someone who does not, you know, who's so against immigration and, and, and refugees? Uh, why do you think we do this? I mean, I, I feel like it's kind of, you know, founded in this idea of, of what is a successful immigrant, mm -hmm. don't you think? I mean, there's, there are Does a lot that make of, sense? You know, it totally makes sense, and it's true. I mean, there are a lot of, you know, uh, fervent supporters of Donald Trump, for example, in the, uh, in the Vietnamese American community, and they will wear the, the red, you know, Make America Great hat, hats again also. And I think there's a, a number of different narratives that, that, are, that are happening there. One is the, Ameri the idea of the American dream. You know, the Vietnamese refugees really believe that they've succeeded in the United States and they've done it the right way and everybody else should do it the right way. Um, and therefore that means, you know, going through the legal procedures and everything. Um, they also participate in a very important American narrative too, which is that um, uh, this is a country in which people get the right to forget where they came from, mm. right? Yeah. Right. I mean, if, if you're an American of three or four generations, you may have a very fuzzy notion of who your ancestors are, how they came here, and so on. And you're, just because they were immigrants two or three or four generations back doesn't mean you're going to be empathetic yeah. with the new immigrants that come in. You, know, you are an American now. And part of, part of what it means to be an American as part of our history is that we have barriers and borders and exclusionary acts and things like this, and the Vietnamese uh, Americans now who want to maintain that border and so on, they're participating in that same American narrative yeah. to become American and to forget where it is that they came from. Yeah. So it's, it's not surprising. It's ironic because we're intimate mm -hmm. with it and, and it's, it's more recent history, but it's completely American yeah. to do these kinds of things. I mean, you've written the, the secondary goal of, of this eth ethics of memory, this is a nothing ever dies again. Uh, the second goal of this ethics of memory, especially for those formally cast as others, is to be empathetic to the ever new others on the horizon. And it seems like it's, it's too easy for us. It, 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 too often this doesn't happen. This, to be empathetic like, to new others? To the new others. Yeah. You know, I think we're all capable of, of empathy, right? And again, this is what narratives and stories are supposed to do. It's supposed to teach us empathy about people who are not like us. We read books or we watch movies about people who are not like us, right? But where, where do we draw that, that circle of empathy? I mean, how far, how far out does it, does it extend? Um, obviously, hopefully most of us are empathetic to our families, yeah. for example. We're empathetic to other Americans, right? 
But who, are, who, who counts as an American? Right? So it's totally possible to say, I empathize with Americans, but my definition of Americans excludes certain kinds of people in this country. Right? And so I think that this is part of, of the political tensions in our country, is that they're competing projects of empathy that are happening here, and competing projects of storytelling about what America is. You know, uh, uh, there's so, some people who want to say, you know, we should expand those borders of empathy to include the undocumented or refugees or immigrants, and there's other people who are saying, no, we just want to take care of Americans, yeah. whatever Americans mean. And these, I don't think these people who advocate for that would say they're not empathetic. They're saying, I am, I am empathetic. I'm just empathetic with the people we need to take care of. To a degree. To a degree. The near and the dear. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I feel that, you know, we as writers, our project is about approaching the far and the feared, whatever, whoever that happens to be. That, those could be like literal populations of people, you know, foreigners, immigrants, undocumented, the people we're at war with, or the far and the feared could be what's inside of us. You know, that's what we as writers are supposed to do. And so I think that's why today um, the literary community is in such an uproar against the current administration because it just feels as if the, our definitions of empathy are radically, radically different. And it is partially based on different ideas of storytelling, different ideas of narrative, different ideas of who it is should be at the center of our stories. But with this new kind of newfound empathy, um, you know, uh, where people do have a language to, um, to both express why, you know, certain representations of them have been uh, either uh, not satisfactory or, or dangerous. Um, how do you then deal with, you know, um, products of the past once you see them in this new light? For example, you know, you go back to, uh, you were talking about the Vietnam War as portrayed in, in, in movies. And, and you've written at length on that. I mean, that, that was a kind of narrative plenitude that Vietnamese Americans did have, but in the bad way, right? Um, for example, you've written about Apocalypse Now and how that became a space for, for uh, white Americans to, to deal with both their, their humanity and humanity. But in doing so, it, 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 it left the Vietnamese only inhuman and, and distanced them. Um, an example like, like Apocalypse Now, and there are many other examples of that. What do you then do with that now that you have this new insight? Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, it, uh, How many people here have actually seen Apocalypse Now? Oh, you come from the generation that has. You know, yeah, I go around now, people like, like teenagers and college students, they've not seen this movie. Really? Right? Yeah, they haven't. I'm shocked. They haven't. They haven't. So, I mean, it used to be a cool thing in college that you had this poster on your. It's your been a long time since we've been in college. Okay, so. <laughs> It's a very generational true. shift. Um, uh, so you, you know what the movie's about, right? And, and I think that for those of us who feel like we've been excluded from narrative plenitude for whatever reason, there's oftentimes impulse that you know, we, can, we need to tell our own stories, we need to, need to get our voices out there, and we've seen that we've been depicted as inhuman mm -hmm. or as stereotypes or whatever in mass media. So we're gonna tell a story, once we have the chance to tell a story, we're gonna tell a story about how, how human we are, about how empathetic we are. And that's powerful. But I, also, I, I think it's actually very limited at the same time. Mm. Because what it means to, to have narrative plenitude and to be a part of the majority is that you can take for granted that you don't have to prove your humanity. That's why in an economy of narrative plenitude, you can have movies about white people who are serial killers, for example, and people are not gonna go out of that movie theater saying, oh my God, all white people are serial killers. Yeah. You know, right? You get to immerse yourself in the world of the serial killer and think, hmm, yes, bad person, but I can empathize if it's a, good, it's a, it's a well done movie you empathize with the full range of human possibility from the inhuman to the human. Okay, so that's why, for example, the TV shows that I was watching when I was writing The Sympathizer were TV shows like The Sopranos or The Wire. Now, these are shows that are not going out there trying to prove the humanity of Americans. It's simply looking at these people who are capable of a range of good and bad things, as we all are. 
That's what we have to do. That's how I feel. When we have the opportunity to tell our own stories, we have to proceed from the assumption that we're already human, which means we're already inhuman at the same time. And my response to Apocalypse Now was not to write a novel that simply showed the tragedy of Vietnamese refugees and our human story and all that. No, The Sympathizer, for those of you who haven't read it, shame on you. <laughs> but it is a story about a spy who has to do bad things. And he's an alcoholic, and he's a womanizer, and he's a murderer, and all this kind of stuff. It's a really good story, OK? Precisely because it doesn't try to prove any humanity or try to make the Vietnamese people look good or anything like that. It does the same kinds of gestures that these stories, like The Sopranos or The Godfather and so on, take for granted, which is that you can have anti-heroes mm. as your representatives, and no one's going to mistake them and somehow telling the entire story about in this case, Vietnamese people. But how do you re-engage with, with something like Apocalypse Now or Platoon or, or Deer Hunter, the kinds of things that are not going to go away from the culture? How do you re-engage it, especially if you had, uh, previous to this new insight, you had a, a positive relationship with it? Um, I mean, I think a lot of the response nowadays, well, I'm canceling it out. You know, uh, It's a larger question, too, but what do you do with like Woody Allen, for example, now that you know Mm -hmm. what you think you know. Um, have you thought about and it's how should the culture, you know, if, if it sees Apocalypse, a movie like Apocalypse now in this new light, mm -hmm. how should it re-engage with it? We should it reject it completely? No, it? no, no, no. I mean, I, I, I have never gone out there and said, just to use Apocalypse Now as an example, we shouldn't watch it or we should ban it or mm -hmm. something like that. Never, never. You know, my, my way to respond to it was to, to make fun of it, to satirize it. There's a big chunk of the novel, The Sympathizer, that is basically a satirization of Apocalypse Now. Um, and and that's, it's a part of our culture, you know, canonical texts like this. Mm -hmm. And we need to respond to it like that. But it's a, very, it's a very intimate question for me because, like, for example, I grew up a huge fan of the Tintin comics. I don't know how many of you read yeah. Tintin, for example, right? OK, I go back and I look at it as an adult. I'm like, oh, there's some, there's some racism in the <laughs> Tintin comics that I enjoyed so much. Um, but I, I actually you know, have pretty much bought the complete collection in French and in English for my son, who's like five years old, and we read it together. And I have to think about, well, these are great stories. He's really into them. But he's also being exposed to a certain idea about race from the 1930s to the 1960s, and Hergé was a liberal, right? He had some liber he was by, by the standards of the day, he was actually sort of you know sympathetic to the colonized and things like that. But there's no doubt that that visually, there are some racist that we what we, what we would now consider to be racist images in these books. And uh, I have I sent my son I sent my son to a school in which apparently the year before he enrolled, a parent got it's a French school, so they're very intimately aware of Tintin. A, you know, a, a parent got so mad about this issue that she wanted to have Tintin pulled from the shelves, and then she took her kid out of the school. Okay, and she was white, all right? And I wouldn't do that, because I think my son, sooner or later, is going to see these kinds of images. And I want to be the one to expose them to him first. I don't want him to be on a, call, a, a school playground and have someone say racist terms to him or do racist gestures or something like that, and then he's going to be all confused and come home to me. Yeah. That's probably going to happen anyway. But these images are already out there. We have to confront them. You know? and, and so that's, that's why I, 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 I read these books with him. And, and he'll, he'll look at it, and he'll say, oh, there's a black man in here. I'm like, that's yeah. a very racist depiction of a black man in here. Yeah. And he's five years old. He's not going to come back at me with like, you know, some kind of you know, discourse about this. <laughs> But I know he's absorbing it, so that we have this capacity to talk about that. Yeah. Uh, I think that's what we have to do with these yeah, kinds of stories. Allow for that confrontation, yeah. right? Um, uh, before I, I give it to uh, audience questions, I do want to ask you about the book you're writing, you're working on now, or at least the one book. I don't know if you're working on multiple projects, but uh, it's a sequel to The Sympathizer. You're, you're calling it The Committed. Mm -hmm. Is that a pretty definite title? Pretty close. Okay. Yeah. And, and you've been working on it. It takes place in Paris. Mm -hmm. And you've been working on it uh, in Paris. And um, I have a couple questions in terms of like how you know, uh, your, your work in fiction uh, in many ways dramatizes the, the many, uh, many of the ideas that you worked out in, in your nonfiction works, uh, your critical works. And I wonder how 
you know, working on the committed has, have you moved beyond some of those ideas? Have you, uh, how have your ideas evolved, especially in light of success of Sympathizer? Um, and how Paris has affected it, actually living there and working there? Well, you know, I, like most of, many people in this room probably, I have, I have very romantic notions of Paris and France, and my wife and I spent seven months there on our, on our honeymoon in 2003. And then, uh, you know, France is a part of our heritage as Vietnamese people. We were colonized by the French for 70 or 80 years. And so I wanted to confront that, that heritage. And The Sympathizer is about an, a guy who's half French and half Vietnamese. So the committed being set in that in Paris was an opportunity to engage with that um, and deal with a country that has a very different sense of race and difference and culture than the United States does. Um, and, it's, and I wanted to, you know, challenge myself. Uh, and it, is, it has been challenging because the experience of the French in regards to all these things is so different than the Americans, and even for the Vietnamese who are in France. You know, I go to France and I'm like, racism, racism, racism. And they're like, that's not racist. You know, that's just, they're just being stupid. And the Vietnamese people here are, are doing great. We're so well adjusted. And it's, it's very hard for me to wrap my American these are mind. French saying this or Vietnamese French? French people of Vietnamese descent. Mm. Okay, so we, they wouldn't say French Vietnamese or Vietnamese French. They don't have hybrid identities, mm. supposedly. Um, so it's 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 a learning experience for me to try to figure out how to acknowledge the legit, legitimacy of these French perspectives and yet also be critical. I can't help but be critical, you know. And so that's that that's the nar the narrative is is partly about that. It's mostly about drugs and sex and violence in Paris of the early 1980s and politics, but um, underlying all of that, there is also But do you concern. ever find yourself, have you found yourself questioning your own stance on certain things because of, of, of these Vietnamese in, in, in Paris and their kind of casual reaction to racism? Yeah, I have because, uh, you know, we're, we're Americans. We're very used to how the American system of yeah. differences work here, right? Yeah. And it's a system that gives us opportunities, but also gives us traps. So I knew, you know, I don't back away from being Vietnamese as a writer. I say I'm a writer, but I also say I'm a minority writer, I'm a Vietnamese writer, I'm all these kinds of things. But I also knew that the, 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 the way by which I'm perceived in this country is through being Vietnamese. And that the way to tell my story, the, one, the story that people expected me to tell would be about Vietnam or, or the Vietnam War. And that's true for all minorities in this country. Uh, we're only allowed one historical experience that the rest of the country knows about. That's the opportunity, and it's also the trap. Because then you're like, oh, he's Vietnamese. He's going to write about the Vietnam War. And so the, 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 what I had to do there was simply to take up that opportunity, but to do it on my own terms. Yeah. Right? Okay. So in France, the difference would be that at least the French would say, you know, that is a total trap, you know, right. to, be, to be stuck on your own difference. You should instead try to be universal, you know, tell the universal story. And I personally think The Sympathizer, for example, is a universal story, but it's read through a Vietnamese history here. Um, so I have to look at France and think, would, it be, would, would, I, would I be different if I was there? Would I actually simply be French? Would that, would that be a possibility? Are the, are, do, the French, are they, are, do the French have something that we don't? Is it actually true that, you know, race is not such a big deal there, et cetera? Um, personally, I, I don't think so, but, but I understand why they think that way, and I want to acknowledge that in the book, but also show how it's also really limited by the French experience yeah. as well. well. What people don't realize sometimes is that the universal is actually very specific. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's not about getting everyone to, to recognize themselves. It's about being specific enough that, so that it resonates, mm -hmm. right? Um, we should have time for audience questions. Sorry, this is, um, not, I'm mad again. Um, so your, everything you're talking about is really interesting because um, we were talking about this earlier during the tour that I'm from the North Midwest. And um, part of my family, I have several members that came back from Vietnam with great uncles. Um, and so you're kind of talking about this identity, but they kind of did the opposite. They assimilated in a very, very, very non-diverse culture. And so I don't know when you see people who do that, if you have certain views or, you know, is that anti your own culture or is, is that appropriate? Just wanted to get your thoughts on that. You're talking about, uh, so they're not, they're not white. They're, right, they okay. came back from Vietnam, okay. but rather than hold on to any of their culture, 
they completely gave it up to right. become completely American and mirror the small communities they're in. Right. You know, I, I, it's hard for me to say because I had the, the luxury of growing up in California, which is obviously much more diverse than North Dakota. And little uh, San Jose is the second largest Vietnamese population in the United States. Um, so if I was in that situation and I was like the one Vietnamese person or the one of a handful of Vietnamese people in that environment or any kind of minority that you're talking about, that's a survival strategy to do that, right? Um, it's, it, it can't come without costs, though, at the same time. So I've, I've met you know, more second generation Vietnamese Americans who've emerged out of those circumstances and they migrated to a, a bigger city or, or, or more, more diverse state. And usually they're pretty regretful that they, they were you know, raised in that kind of environment where their, his, their, their history and their specificity was denied to them. You know? And that, with the situation that you're talking about looks a lot more like, like France. Because most of the Vietnamese I met there were like, well, we ended up in a, in, a, in a place where there was no other Vietnamese people. So we had no choice but to assimilate. Um, they were okay with that because that's the only option that they really had. And then they became assimilated functional members of French society and everything like that. But at the price, if it is a price, of not feeling comfortable associating with other Vietnamese or or Asian people. We would see, I would see that as a cost. Uh, that, that wouldn't necessarily be the case in, in France or in North Dakota if people never left. So in other words, there, I, don't have, I, don't, I, re, I don't want to make a judgment about people who, who don't have any other option right. when they're put in that situation. That makes sense. But the, the culture that we do share, though, is something like Hollywood. <coughs> like We all have Hollywood, right? So that's what the issue of narrative scarcity and narrative plenitude is about. Like, you could be the only Vietnamese person in North Dakota or that particular city, and if you don't see yourself at all in mainstream culture, you're encouraged to forget your differences. But what if that mainstream culture was different? You could still be the only Vietnamese person in that particular place, but if you had access to all these books and all these movies and so on, all these stories, it would completely change your perception of who you are out there. Hi there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you for coming and joining us. Uh, my name is Nelson. Uh, my question is, so I'm, I'm Cuban. I was born on the island. I grew up in Miami, which is basically Cuba. But uh, outside of those, that area in Miami, <clears throat> what I come across in conversations when I meet someone and they, they figure out or I tell them that I'm Cuban is older generations immediately think of Cold War, communism. Younger generations just go immediately to tourism, uh, food, maybe. Uh, I'm just curious as, um, you know, seeing parallel situations between Vietnam, maybe in a more, um, for lack of a better word, a violent history with the U.S., but kind of similar with communism and the struggles they had there. Do you find a more nuanced conversation when you meet people when you talk about Vietnam, or is it basically sticking to what older generations think about Vietnam and what younger generations think about, like Vietnamese food or going to visit, like the Vietnamese part of neighborhood and eating? Uh, bond means or whatever it might be? Uh, you know, it's a big country, so there's so many different experiences that people have, you know, so when I go and I go to speak to college campuses, it's a very different experience than going to Palm Springs and speaking to retirement community or going to Idaho, which is like 80, 87 or 89 percent white. So I can sort of feel the differences there in terms of responses. So when I'm on a college campus and the people are young and they're diverse and they're obviously being college educated, the level of responses is really different because they already know about pho and banh mi and all of this and they're, they're hungry for um, uh, these more nuanced statements about what America is and, and what our stories should be, for example. Uh, if I go to, you know, Palm Springs, just to use that example, and the average age is like 60 or 70 in the audience, it's a totally different experience. It is more like what you're talking about. You know, the, 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 the notions of awareness of the stories of, of, that we're talking about is, is much more limited, right? Um, so for example, I went to Palm Springs. First question from the audience was, and this was, this was uh, several months ago, have you seen that new Ken Burns documentary about the Vietnam War? Okay. Uh, 
and in my mind, I was like, that's an 18 hour documentary. <laughs> I don't have 18 hours. And if you have 18 hours to watch a documentary, you have enough time to read a book by a Vietnamese person. Because whoever asked me that question, whenever that question came up in audiences like that, they had never read a book by a Vietnamese person or seen a movie from a Vietnamese <laughs> point of view. So it's such a, it's such a radically different uh, ex uh, set of experiences from one end of the country to the next. Um, went to Clemson University. First question from the audience was a guy who looked like he literally was a Confederate veteran. And it was about the Confederacy, which had nothing to do with my talk. You know, so that's the beauty and the, the, the challenge of, of a country like this, is that you will have people who know exactly what you're talking about, and you have people who have no idea what you're talking about. And again, that's what we're doing with trying to expand our stories and our narratives, is to eventually get to all these different people, but also especially to uh, the next generation as well. Hi, thank you so much for speaking. Um, as a Nigerian, a person who's born in Nigeria, I can definitely hear my story and my parental experience reflected in a lot of what you say, um, although Nigerians are a bit more invisible in the sense of how we blend into American society. Um, but what I hear a lot about you know, writing from you is the, this idea of the need for vulnerability. Right? So in order to really tell the story that you want to tell um, in your books, you have to face um, the idea that you're not necessarily going to talk about the Vietnamese experience in a way that people expect. So I just want to know what influences did you have as far as books that you read, experiences that you had that allowed you to step fully into that state of vulnerability as a writer, young, and then moving through your career that kind of shaped the way you thought about these are the stories that I'm going to tell regardless of what people think that I should be talking about or what they're going to try to engage me on, even though it has nothing to do with my book or the talk that I, I came to give? Well, you know, one of my uh, writing instructors when I was in college, Bharati Mukherjee, you know, read one of my short stories and he said, you're not cutting close enough to the bone. I was like 19 or 20. I was like, what does that mean? You know, if, if it literally means cutting to the bone, I can do that. Taking a knife to cut yourself is okay. Most writers would do that. If, they, if you could get a good story by cutting yourself, you would totally do it. All right. <laughs> Uh, but what she meant, I think, was that I wasn't getting vulnerable enough. I wasn't going deep enough inside. Uh, that's really hard to do, because I think most of us don't want to do that. We've built up these protections against the things that have hurt us, the things that make us most vulnerable in order to function. Um, and I didn't know how to do that as a person or as a writer. And you asked for a list of books, and I can give you a ton, all, all great books are about writers getting vulnerable. Whether or not they're, whether they're autobiographical or not, you may not see the mechanism in operation, but I, maybe, you, I don't know if you feel this way, but you know, to be a writer, you have to be vulnerable to yourself. And because you, the, the experience that matters the most is not like going out there and like chopping lumber or working in a nail salon or whatever, to, or going to war to accumulate experience. The most important experience is your emotional experience. That's what you draw from in order to imbue feeling into your work. So Toni Morrison and say, writes beloved, she was not a slave, right? She somehow had to find those emotions within herself. So I don't know what emotional journey she undertook. In my case, the stories that I had to confront were not the stories in books, although I read a lot of those. The story I had to confront was my own. To confront my, confront my own family's refugee experience, confront my own refugee experience. Stuff that I had lived through, that we had lived through, that I had just, I never forgotten them, but I had sort of sealed them off and not felt those emotions. That was difficult to go back there and to look at those to look at those experiences, um, and there's there's no one who can teach you how to do that except for maybe your therapist, you know. But in my case, it was thank God I never saw a therapist. I had to do it through through my writing instead. Uh, so hopefully that answers the question. We have one final question. Hi. I have a question in 20 parts, so this is great. Um, but So my name is Andy Wien. I'm a first generation uh, Vietnamese American born here in Chicago. Um, and I actually wanted to talk to both of you about your, your view of ethnic enclaves, I'll call them. So growing up in Chicago, I actually didn't grow up in Argyle or Vietnamese people called Agai. Like that's where that the Vietnamese area is. In Chicago. That's true. In Chicago, yeah. Um, and so I grew up kind of away from it. So um, we would come here and, you know, be like, wow, there's like a thousand Vietnamese people, so cool. 
And then when I was 18 or 20 or something, I went to Westminster and I was blown away. It was like Vietnamese flags everywhere. I thought I was in Vietnam, frankly. So I wanted to get your POV because I'm actually, I'm torn, right? Because there is the power of having all the people in one place but that also breeds different types of prejudices, right? There are areas in, in Vietnamese towns where, you know, there's just a lot of prejudice in the area. So I was gonna say, what do you think the balance is, you know? And going to, we've been, my wife and I, we went to Paris and there is different types of, you know, you don't really see all of these Vietnamese people all in one place because they have a different sense to identity. So just your POV would be great. Well, I can always, speak for myself, I, I feel like I have to constantly fight the need to be special. W because I grew up, uh, you know, uh, in Oklahoma. You know, I was the only Vietnamese person I ever saw. And, uh, and yes, that comes with feeling like an outsider and feeling alienated, but also I always had a feeling of specialness too, if that makes sense. And, and when you start engaging with your, you know, when I started engaging with Vietnamese communities, um, I had to fight that urge, that desire to be special, like, and, and it made me try to break down what that actually means, and why I, I felt the need to have it, and um, and what was the cost of that, you know. Uh, that's my, been my experience with it, you know. Uh, I'm only now engaging more with with the Vietnamese community, um, and it's it's brought it's brought perspectives to me that I've never had. I'm 43. Um, and it's very meaningful to me, but I'm still fighting that, that need to be, you know, the only Asian person in the room, which is weird that I would even want that, right? Well, to pick up on one element of what you said, Andy, um, maybe the implication is what you're saying. Uh, Vietnamese people can be racist too, you know, and as a matter of fact, they're pretty, ra we're pretty racist, okay? I'm just judging very much so. from the, <laughs> the comments that I hear in Vietnamese, in Vietnamese yes. language communities and so on. Uh, the casual racism, the, sh the deeply embedded prejudices that people have. What it goes to show is that it doesn't matter if you're a minority, right? Just because you've been the victim of racism doesn't mean you can't be a racist yourself. And as a matter of fact, oftentimes you are a racist yourself. It's just that these are the di unfortunate dynamics of human uh, experience. Um, and what that meant for me, uh, both as a writer, but also as someone who's Vietnamese and as someone who thinks about politics and political stories, is that my, my, my commitment is, is, as a writer is twofold. One is that it is certainly to the Vietnamese community and to tell our stories and all of that kind of thing. But the second obligation is to truth and justice, you know, to use these grand words. And if your community is doing something wrong, you need to stand up against it. That's the role of the writer, right? And the role of the writer is, is complex. It's both to represent, right, but it's also to oppose. And again, the dynamics of being a minority in this country or any country, oftentimes is you feel simply the desire to represent. Like we've been misrepresented, we've, there's not been enough, enough representation, therefore we have to represent. But again, if your community is, dumped, do, is doing something wrong, you have to represent that. Now, now that is a, a, the, the, the real challenge, I think. And if we think of ourselves as Americans, uh, many American writers, you know, do not go out there thinking we have to represent America. That's not the first thing that most American writers or artists are thinking about. They're thinking my first obligation is to the art, and then it's to the truth and justice, and if it's oftentimes in opposition to America itself, either America in terms of what it's doing overseas, or America, what's happening wrong within our country today, whatever that happens to be. That's part of what it means to be a part of the majority, right? And that's also, if you're a minority writer, that's what you have to do as well. You cannot feel that your first obligation is, is only to your ethnicity or your culture or something like that. That's part of it. But you, the first obligations are to your principles, your art, truth, justice, things like that. And so um, th you know, that's part of, I think, what's going to happen with uh, something like Vietnamese American. Uh, writing and so on, is that you know, they, they, they have to depict the, those kinds of things. They have to de depict both the beauty of Little Saigon, but also, of course, the fact that it's a deeply, it's almost a fascistic yeah. community out there. And if you step out of line, they will, they will get in your face <laughs> and make sure you don't say another word. Okay. Thank you very much, Google, for coming out today. Great time for your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.